358,000 gallons of water. Every single day? Yep. Where is all of this water coming from? Because we're basically in the middle of a desert. Mm -hmm. Right. At its core, human footprint is our story. It's a story of humans, how they've changed the planet in so many strange, weird, fundamental ways. But then also how those changes kind of flip back around and change who we are as a species. We wanted to make a science series that really explored the way in which we transform the planet. We have an episode on invasive species. Um, we have an episode all about dogs. We have an episode about cities. And then looking at humans as the world's top predator. It's a complicated world out there, and issues you might have a strong opinion about are a lot more complicated than you might think. In large part, PBS is the reason why I'm a scientist and the reason why I've gravitated toward storytelling. Those first people who looked like me that I actually saw storytelling were all on PBS. There's such a rich history in PBS and proud to now sort of be a part of that history. That was the trailer for the new PBS docuseries, Human Footprint, and this is Factual America. I'm your host, Matthew Sherwood. Each week I watch a hit documentary and then talk with the filmmakers and their subjects. The Earth has never experienced anything like it. A single species dominating and transforming the planet almost overnight. We are, of course, talking about humans. Biologist Shane Campbell Staten travels the globe to explore our human footprint. In the process, he discovers how the things we do actually reveal who we truly are. Join us as we talk with the award-winning directors and producers, Nate Dappen and Neil Lawson, about this ambitious project. Like their docuseries, the conversation takes us in unforeseen directions, from dancing dogs, duck call competitions, and fast-adapting lizards. Stay tuned. Nate Dappen and Neil Lawson, welcome to Factual America. How are things with you, Nate? Things are great. Thanks so much for having us on. Yeah, it's great to have you. And Neil, how are things with you? All good here. It's a little smoky in central Pennsylvania, but otherwise great. Is that from Canada? It is from Canada. Yeah, I flew through Detroit a few weeks ago, and I you, well, I didn't see Detroit basically because it was yeah. so uh, yeah, <laughs> it was yeah, so it's bad. kind of been like that all week here. So, yeah. but uh, hopefully we're coming on the other other side of it. Yeah, well, we're we're not here to talk about Canadian forest fires, or we can if we want, uh, but. Uh, we're here to talk about Human Footprint. Uh, episode 1 premiered on July 5th on PBS. Uh, I think you can also catch it on Amazon Prime, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and, uh, yeah, welcome to Factual America. It's great to have you on, and uh, congratulations. It's quite an uh, ambitious project that you took on, and you must feel quite uh, relieved that this is finally in the can and, and being released. Yeah, no, it's really exciting to see it out in the world and, and to finally be able to share share it with audiences. So uh, as we tend to get started around here, maybe, um, Nate, maybe you can uh, give our listeners and, and viewers a, a synopsis. What is Human Footprint all about? Yeah, sure. So Human Footprint is, is a series that explores how humans have transformed the planet, but like Parts Unknown is sort of a food show that really explores human history and culture. Human Footprint is a science show that explores human history and culture. So it's kind of an exploration of who, who we are as a species by looking at the things that we've done to transform the world. Um, so it's uh, definitely, you know, a film that explores um, some of the big scale transformations we've made, but we've tried to sort of shape each episode in a way that helps people leave with questions about who we are as a species. Well, that's interesting, and I and I've, I have seen this. Well, at least a rough cut, I think, of of the six episodes. So uh, no, it's 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 very interesting, and I really enjoyed it. Um, but you uh, you you kick off with uh, uh, your first episodes on invasive species, um, and uh, uh, why did you kick off with that, uh, Neil? Is that uh, what do invasive species say about ourselves? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, <clears throat> I think a lot of people. Um, might not appreciate uh, how big of an impact invasive species have had globally. 
Um, they're the second leading cause of species extinctions around the world after habitat loss. And, uh, you know, it's pretty clear that this is a human driven phenomenon, right? That's kind of, it's kind of baked into the definition of what an invasive species is, right? These are species that we've moved from one place on the world to another place or, or many places in some cases. And, uh, and these species have unexpected impacts where they go. And um, it's sort of one of these interesting cases where a tendency of ours, the tendency to want to control the environment around us and, and the species that are in it, um, has this kind of uh, multiplication effect because these species also have their own agendas that they start to pursue wherever they've been introduced. Um, and for us, this was a, a, a great human footprint story because it isn't just about what these animals and plants have done to the environments where they've been introduced, but but it's about how we've responded to that and the way we think about them. You know, we we use the language of warfare often, talking about invasive species and you know being in a battle for an ecosystem, and um, and uh, and yet this is fundamentally a human problem, right? It's 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 the fact that we can't stop moving stuff around the planet that causes this issue. Um, and so there's a lot of values that that get uh, laden into this issue. And, and that was really the, the core of what we wanted to explore more than any particular species was sort of how our species deals with the cognitive dissonance of having created this incredible problem that we are now unable to solve. We really tried to shape the episode in a way that took people from something that seemed really simple to a, a, like a species like the Burmese python, where it's a relatively new phenomenon. These are pets that get too big and people don't want 14, 16 foot snakes. They get them as babies and, and they say, yikes, this is scary. So they release them out into the Everglades and those cause a lot of problems. And there's not a lot of controversy. Everyone wants the Burmese pythons out. And then we move backwards in time from there to Asian carp, which were brought over originally to control wastewater, got released. And now they're already here. They're here to stay. We're not going to get rid of them. They're slowly getting woven into the culture around the Mississippi Basin. From there, we go further back into horses. Horses went extinct in the Americas around 10,000 years ago. Europeans brought them back in the late 1400s. They became woven into everything we think about as American, into native tribes, into our culture. And they are feral and they cause lots of problems. And so a lot of people think they belong. A lot of people don't. Then we go even further back in time to pigs where pigs arrived in the Hawaiian Islands around the same time as the Hawaiians did. And it's complicated. Those pigs have been there long enough to integrate into the ecosystem. The ecosystem has been changed fundamentally. They are integral parts of the Hawaiian culture. How do you think about them? And I think what you end up coming out with is that there are lots of species that aren't native that we said, okay, it's okay that these are here. And there are lots that we say they aren't. And it has everything to do with value judgments. And we sort of now we get to decide what we want to do because we're so, so, in, you know, we have such a huge impact on the planet. So that's kind of our thinking with that episode. Yeah, no, I think it was. So, I mean, it, it struck me and I think this is something that comes throughout your, uh, the series is this, uh, you're talking about how humans have transformed the planet or continue to transform the planet. Yet there's this feedback loop, doesn't it? It also, we're transformed by these, what we do. Uh, and so you have things like in the, so starting with the, at the beginning of that episode, you've got uh, a woman who's a real estate agent who's quit her job to be a full-time Burmese python hunter. I mean, who I, I had no idea people were doing stuff like that, that you could make a yeah, living that way. Yeah, well, there, there aren't many of them, but a small number of uh, brave souls have uh, given up all kinds of different careers, I think, to become, become python hunters. I think some for the adventure of it and the sort of macho aspect of it, mm. some because it's just a, you know, a place that they love. A habitat that they love and they think they can make a difference right and donna really was a fantastic character donna khalil i mean she deserves to have a whole documentary made about her <laughs> and actually there 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 have been um, okay <laughs> so it was, it was it was fun to get to spend some time with her yeah no i think uh and then uh, just little things like uh i mean i th i think one of your one someone you interview says if people only knew how much money spent on the wild horses you know in in the in the west of the united states but I was just struck by how much effort's going into just to co contain these carp 
you know i mean there's this yeah. the whole you know core of engineers is people with full-time jobs just to try to figure out how you're going to contain these these species but i think no that's a very good interesting point and then also the stuff about uh, uh all the things about hawaii it was very interesting in terms of uh um yeah i mean what struck me is maybe you know one per it's almost like weeds someone said weeds are just plants that people don't like you know i mean and what's an invasive species isn't it i mean yeah uh, and i think it even comes up later in an episode on when you talk about coyotes in a way that not that they're an invasive species but how people how we interact with things and our, our values yeah absolutely now to be a bit boring i'll go you know then you had episode two's uh I, you know i'm going a little chronologically here in terms of episodes but uh uh july 12th you've got uh humankind's you, you had this uh what is it called top predator and it's uh it's about humankind's ability to hunt and kill and how that's transformed the pl transformed the planet and uh um i i think what was interesting is shane you're you're the host uh who presenter on this is uh, i think you're you start off with a duck call competition and he asks uh if you ask me where i would be a couple of years ago, I'd be here. I'd just, you know, be laughing at you. And do you find, I mean, do you find yourselves asking those same questions when you're filming this? You must be thinking, how did this, how did we end up at a duck calling competition in Eastern Maryland? I mean, yeah, the, the duck calling competition was just a wonderful surprise. Certainly never thought I would be at a duck calling competition. But I think as, as many maybe listeners or documentary filmmakers have experienced, our job is such a unique and 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 wonderful job in that we end up in the most bizarre situations kind of all the time and you kind of pinch yourself you're like i am you know i'm, I'm in a i'm in a duck calling competition i'm in the arctic with sled dogs you know i'm on a pig hunt i'm in a boat with thousands of carp jumping up out of the water and hitting me i mean it's kind of like one of those really fun kind of things you know you're having once in a lifetime experiences all the time for your job so um, yeah, I, I, I feel really lucky to, to get to experience those things. You know, with Human Footprint, we did so much traveling that it was almost like drinking from a fire hose of life-changing experiences. You know, it was like right. every week we were doing three or four things that I couldn't have imagined doing a year before. And each one of them was a profound experience. And, um, you know, I'm still sort of shell-shocked from it, trying to sort out how I feel about all the different experiences I had, what I've learned and how what I've learned has integrated into sort of my worldview. Um, but yeah, um, the duck calling competition was pretty fantastic. We met a wonderful guy named Ramsey Russell. He's a, a world famous duck hunter from Mississippi originally, but he spends most of the year hunting ducks. And, you know, I, I think as, you know, Neil and I, neither of us grew up in hunting culture. And um, I think, I think probably both of us and Shane included, We've got our stereotypes of hunters, mm. um, but Ramsey Ramsey was just this, you know, he was like a poet, philosopher, duck hunter, and getting to spend a morning with him and hearing his worldview and understanding the role that he plays in keeping ducks around is is was, was really eye-opening and, uh, and I think made for great television too. I think, uh, you know, I have, I have nothing but admiration for those filmmakers who can find the the beauty in the mundane uh but that is not <laughs> the human footprint experience right exactly. every i feel like every, exactly. every shoot you're doing something exactly. so strange and so out of the ordinary um it makes it for you know a really fun process of making it but hopefully also a really a really uh fun ride for anybody who, who's watching there was a there, there was an article that that came out um that was a review of the series and i think i think one of the criticisms was that it had like that sort of sensational discovery-esque sort of um uh style to it and i think yeah. part of that was because the phenomenon we were uh we were exploring are just like they're all so insane i mean <laughs> just in that in that you know like the 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 it looks like a the, the list of species that we cover just in that invasive species story it's like a carnival list of like uh shows that you might see it's like python hunting right. um car right carp derby horse roundup you know <clears throat> you know pig hunting pig gross i mean it was like a, yeah. it's yeah all these yeah. things are, are pretty crazy and and sensational yeah. but we kind of their everyday life for the people who live them um and we don't often stop to think how bizarre the world that we live in actually is nowadays yeah it was a 
the fifty most dangerous reptiles. You know, that kind <laughs> of thing. exactly, exactly. <laughs> but it is. I mean, you know, it's yeah. I I think. Well, isn't it because of? I mean, it kind of comes out in some of the later episodes too. I mean, it's just that it is such a strange and crazy world that we live in that we don't. I don't know. We like to think it isn't, or I don't know what it is that we think most of us humans, but uh, it is. It's just. It's just crazy. You know, and these these things, and there are these, I mean, these interactions that, uh, you, these connections, I mean, connections is another word you could use to describe a lot of what you're showing, and that's uh, these connections that you didn't necessarily knew they existed, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then, I mean, as filmmakers, I was going to ask you later, but how, as filmmakers, how much of this process of discovery is something, I mean... I know with docs, it is all about following a story, and 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 uh, you know these things happen, and you end up at duck calling competitions. But uh, um, how much of this was played out as you were doing the the project in terms of this this sort of connections between seemingly unrelated phenomenon and species and and the like? I think um, for a series like this, you, you have to pre-produce everything you know, um, to a really, to a really high degree. Um, that doesn't mean that we're not ready in the field for those moments of spontaneity and, and those, you know, unexpected gems that you encounter along the way. But in terms of like, I would say the large scale kind of episodic structure, um, both across and within the episodes, like that, that really is established long before we're, we ever go out in the field. Um, and you know, there were a couple of, cases where i would say you know in post-production mm-hmm. we sort of encountered through what we actually the material we actually captured in the field a new way to sequence the stories right, um right. that was sort of unexpected and cool um but that was that was sort of as as serendipitous as it got you know at that scale now within each story of course you we might meet a character and say you know like, oh my gosh we have to we have to go film this guy carving a duck decoy because he's just such a character um, or, or something like that. But, uh, but yeah, the, the larger scale structure is, is, is definitely envisioned beforehand. Otherwise it just wouldn't make any sense. These are such globe spanning, you know, and said very unexpected in some cases narratives. And so the most episode three just uh, released uh, what yesterday, I guess. And uh, Mm -hmm. on PBS and, why did you decide to dedicate a whole episode to dogs? I, I think of all the episodes, the dog episode is by far the most fun. So we we um, we it's we, my we favorite. Made an episode. Yeah, it's 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 a great episode. Yeah. Um, it's very good television. I think you know dogs. We call them man's best friend, and they are an integral part of many of our lives. They're one of the most popular pets in the world, and they have fundamentally changed human history in a lot of different ways. And just like I was saying in that last answer, we often don't think how insane it is that there in our house <laughs> is the descendant of a wolf licking our children's face, begging for scraps. Right. And follow and it knows how to it knows how to it can it can understand our language, it can understand our gestures. And you know, when you look in the wild and you see there's just, you know, uh, several hundred thousand wolves and then almost a billion dogs you know there's a, i think something like there's like a, a, a million dogs born every day or something like that you start to think you start to realize how incredibly linked this animal success has been to our success in the world and then as we started digging into the dog story we also started learning a lot of sort of um myths that i had heard throughout my life about the way dogs were domesticated. I, you know, I, saw, I think we learned a lot about the history of dogs working on this episode. Um, and then of course got to have some fantastic adventures. You know, one of the things we really wanted to show in the episode was how dogs transformed human life, human culture, and how this has truly mm-hmm. been a symbiotic relationship. And so we got to go up to the Arctic to go hunting with this, uh, this young hunter uh, in Resolute Bay, which is very, very far north in the Arctic Circle. He's a an Inuit hunter who lives in Resolute Bay and he uses his sled dogs to go hunt. And um, when you go out there, which was one of the wildest trips of my life, you realize that there is no easy way to live in this place without these dogs. The dogs depend on the people and the people depend on the dogs. And um, 
it was pretty remarkable to see that that human canine relationship in sort of its full glory. But then, but then you see it out there and you think, wow, look at this. This is crazy. And then 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 we went to Durham and filmed these dog dancers right. where they've utilized that same relationship to have fun, right? Where the dogs have learned human gestures and language in a way that allows them to have this very sophisticated, non-choreographed freestyle dancing. And it's just for fun. Um, and so it sort of spans human survival to human leisure um, in, the, in the whole episode. And then, of course, we learn a lot about um, dog genetics and how dog genetics um, mm. is teaching us a lot about uh, our own our own our own biology and and um, helping us cure diseases um, that were very difficult to understand without dog genetics. I mean, I will say as a dog owner, you'll never uh, look at your dog the same again after seeing this episode. Yeah, for sure. The other, the, you know, the, you asked the question of, of, you know, why have a whole episode about dogs, but we could have easily made more episodes about dogs. I mean, if you look across the series, dogs show up in other places yep. too, not just in the dog episode, right? We have, right. we have rat hunting dogs in the yep. episode about cities. We have, uh, you know, wolves in the episode about hunting. We have coyotes in the episode about cities as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there's all these interesting dog connections uh, to just about every aspect of our lives. So it, it, it uh, once we started thinking about that, it really seemed like a no brainer that we had to do a whole, a whole episode on this species. Yeah, no, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was fascinating. And uh, though I don't think I could ever get my dog to dance like that, nor would I, would I try, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> uh, but I may, he doesn't know what he's missing out on, I think. So, um, but, uh, and then we've got, that's just the first half. You've got three more episodes coming out. Um, uh, Neil, mean, what are we going to see? And, you know, what is sort of ones about, uh, I think as you already mentioned, there's one on uh, replacements on how basically humans pick favorites. And then there's mm -hmm. the, oh yeah, the, so this one on the urban jungle, uh, what I found interesting is that Shane uh, makes a comment about, he makes, he, he's seeing urban, you know, cities as a new ecosystem. And he says that's a bit of a controversial statement. What is, uh, is he being just very geeky scientist about it? Or is this, uh, is it really is that much of a controversy? Um, I think, I think there are a lot of uh, scientists, biologists, ecologists mm. who, you know, they trained in a world where, you know, you think about your different biomes, your different habitats and cities were never on that list, you know, mm. um, all the while cities have been growing and multiplying around the world. There are more cities now, they're larger now than they've ever been. More than half the world's population lives in a city. And uh, I think what's, what's interesting about cities as quote unquote ecosystems is that if you look at cities around the world, they have much more in common because they're all cities mm -hmm. than they have differences because they're in different parts of the world. Right. So if you look at Singapore and Miami, you know, the kinds of species that live in those cities, uh, the kinds of ecological interactions that they're having um, are much more similar than you would expect for two places that are on opposite sides of the planet. Mm. Um, and so I think cities really are an emerging biome, for lack of a better term, that right. that uh, is sort of homogeneous around the world and deserves to be studied for for uh, all the lessons it can teach us. And I thought it was amazing how quickly some of the some of the um, well, I think mutations is the wrong word, but some of the, but how quickly things are changing with these animals. Just you, you know. You're talking about even only like 30 year periods here. Yeah, so actually both Neil and I studied lizards for our PhDs before we went into film. Oh wow. And Neil did, Neil did his PhD studying those lizards, those uh, those lizards, those anolis lizards in Miami. Oh. Okay. Um, he okay. wasn't you know and he was studying a different set of questions but it was definitely about adaptation, rapid adaptation to a sort of new environment. Yeah. Um, so, you know, lizards, lizards run deep at, at, at day's edge. We've, we've also made the, <laughs> the authoritative right. film about, about, about lizards yeah. called Laws of the Lizard, which is all about the stuff that's come out of all the amazing, amazing research and insights in virtually every field of biology because of these enormous lizards. But I'll let Neil talk about the, uh, the rapid evolution because that's definitely his wheelhouse. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny that the, uh, 
we met Shane, the host of Human Footprint, mm. on a shoot for that film, Laws of the Lizard, uh, uh, for Smithsonian Channel that Nate just mentioned. And so at that point, Shane was uh, a graduate student. He was collaborating. He had just started his collaboration with Kristen Winchell, who you also see in Human Footprint. Right. Right. Um, and we filmed them for that for that uh, that program. And then, uh, you know, later reconnected with Shane on another another project when he was a postdoc. Um, that's kind of when we started developing this idea. Uh, and then ultimately, you know, he's a professor now and, and, and uh, was a professor, had just, just become a professor when we first pitched this series. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, it took a few years for everything to, to take off. But it's pretty cool to see that, yeah, that, that, uh, that spark of an idea, you know, that came from um, thinking about lizards and thinking about how fast can evolution happen, um, becoming a part of that you know, that, that initial, uh, program laws of the lizard. And then, and then kind of coming full circle all the years, years later and yeah. featuring the same characters with new findings, new discoveries, and, uh, and still, you know, still pushing the boundaries of knowledge with these, these lizards that we all, uh, geek out about together. <laughs> well, I have to check out that, uh, that other, uh, uh, documentary of yours and, uh, I, where I grew up uh, in the states, we had a, a no lizards as well. I had no idea they were so prevalent in the uh, in the uh, academic literature as as it has comes yeah. out in in the episode. So um, uh, anyway, I think that actually takes us a good. This might be a good time to have a quick break. Uh, let our listeners and uh, viewers have a quick break. So we'll be right back with Nathan Dappen and Neil Lawson, the award-winning filmmakers behind Human Footprint on PBS. And you can also, I believe, find it on Amazon Prime. You're listening to Factual America. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at Alamo Pictures to keep up to date with new releases or upcoming shows. Check out the show notes to learn more about the program, our guests, and the team behind the production. Now back to Factual America. Welcome back to Factual America. I'm here with Nate Daphne and Neil Lawson, the award-winning filmmakers behind Human Footprint on, on PBS and Amazon Prime. Episode 1 premiered on July 5th. Three episodes released thus far and with three more to come. Um... So you were already Neil. You're already uh, talking about uh, how this kind of project came about. So this is something you 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 guys developed uh, and, um, and then pitched. Um, um, but do you want to say anything more about that? I mean, how what was the idea, the genesis of of this um, uh, of this uh, this idea and project? Yeah. So uh, as Nate mentioned, he and I both trained as evolutionary biologists, and one thing that really interested us and and st obviously still interests us mm -hmm. is how humans are reshaping the course of evolution for many species around the globe mm -hmm. and nate and i had started to develop a uh, a pitch around this concept a pitch for a limited series mm -hmm. uh, and uh and then we we met shane we worked with shane on a couple of projects he participated actually in a science communication workshop that we were leading and he came to us after the workshop and said, hey, guys, I think I think we should do a television series about evolution in the age of humans. And we thought, OK, yeah, great. We're on board. We've already been thinking about this. Right. And then he said, I think I should be the host. <laughs> and um, and we, we looked at each other and we're like, oh, that's that's really interesting. Right. We, mm. we could tell. Uh, that, you know, we hadn't filmed Shane in the context of him being a host before, um, but we had filmed him. Um, we could tell that he was a, you know, a really dynamic guy. Uh, we had seen him present in front of an audience live and how mm -hmm. he just kind of, you know, turned on and the audience really engaged with him. We thought, man, he could really be a star on television. And maybe, you know, adding him to this concept that we were already developing as the host, um, would sort of give it the secret sauce that it needed right, to right. to really get some traction, and so we started working together on this pitch. And um, what we initially pitched to PBS was that kind of concept, the slightly narrower concept of evolution in the age of humans, and we pitched it as a limited series. Um, and Bill Gardner, our our EP at PBS, came back and said, "You know, love this, love Shane." 
um, we're really looking for things that, you know, could potentially come back for more than one season. So what would you do to this concept to make it into that? Mm-hmm. And, and Bill actually came up with the idea of, you know, what if it's not just about evolution? What if, what if it's about human impacts more broadly? And what if we just call it human footprint? So that's right. where the title came from. It's from that conversation with, mm-hmm. with Bill, who became our EP. Um, and that really just, you know, kind of blew the doors off the thing. And, and we started thinking more broadly about, okay, we can do all this interesting stuff here. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah. And then the, the rest, the rest is history. I think one and, thing I'll add too, is that Shane, you know, um, Shane, Shane definitely wasn't like just a host collaborator. Like Shane's involvement was deep, you know, from, from the very beginning. And his input, not just on like the science topics, you know, I think his his knowledge about that stuff is deeper than our own because it's his specific field. That's what he sort of specializes in is evolution mm-hmm. uh, driven by by human activity. But but you know, I think stylistically, even having Shane there, I think helped us um, really think differently about how to make this show. I think we knew from the beginning that we wanted to look and feel different, and we were looking, we were watching a lot of shows that we loved and we were watching a lot of shows that were airing on these types of these types of networks and we mm. we really wanted to think hard about how we could make this show different how we could make Shane a different kind of host um and 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 Shane was integral to those to those sort of uh creative brainstorming sessions that gave gave the show the flavor that I think um is unique about it yeah i think it's a good uh, that's th- thanks for raising that point Nick cuz i think also what i was going to ask is then because in, and Neil, you've already mentioned how collaborative the process was as well. Um, so then did he like this, you know, the final episode, episode six on the history of cotton, is that something that Shane had a big input into? Cause obviously it's very pers it, there's a, obviously a very personal element for him. I mean, it's personal for the U- U S generally, uh, given our history. What? Well, yeah, I can't, I can't remember specifically, but I, you know, I knew, this was one of those stories that the connection between, you know, deep, deep time, like really deep, deeper than humanity, hundreds, right. hundred, hundred million years of, of geologic history and how that underlies the South and how those, you know, those minerals in the soil and stuff have, have shaped so much of the history that's come afterwards. Um, it's almost like, it's almost like a human footprint story in reverse where it's like the planet is shaping us. But then it has a human footprint story layered on top of it, because then there's human beings making decisions in the context of this landscape that profoundly alter not only the the environment around us, but the the lives of, in this case, you know, tens of millions of people. Um, And I think as soon as we started talking about that, we realized that even though this is like a a little bit of a departure, I think, from the human footprint Mm -hmm. formula, that it it you know, in spirit, it really fit in with the rest of the series. Um, and you're absolutely right that, you know, Shane had to give a lot of himself and really open him, himself up um, in in some conversations that are, you know, not easy conversations to have, um, mm. you know, conversations about very dark periods in our history and, and in, you know, inequities that still persist today. Um, and our, our hope is just that, you know, in presenting this story that that um, people think about, you know, how decisions that we make uh, can, you know, can have these these cascading repercussions over generations and generations. Um, and that's not something that just happens in the past. That's that's something that's still true about decisions we make today in ways that we might not expect. But then, um, Nate, you're also talking about sort of how you're inspired and how this is going to be something kind of a, a different series. Maybe we don't usually talk about music in uh, Nature Docs, but uh, n- music play, you know, plays a large part in this, in this uh, series. Maybe you could say a little bit about that. Well, I, I, um, I, I came of age in the 90s, and um, rap, rap was the music that I listened to most in the 90s. The first album I ever bought was Snoop Dogg's Doggy Style, followed oh, by wow. many other classics in the mid '90s. And um, Shane and I, um, Shane is also a '90s rap fanatic, and we bonded over a lot of our favorite rap songs. And at that time, Marvel's Luke Cage had just come out, which I think is the best of all the Marvel series that have come out. Right. And um, and we were geeking out about the music and how how awesome it was. Neil Neil Shane and I. And um, 
I, we, at the same time, we were trying to figure out how to make this show really be something that felt like Shane. And so, our, you know, we went to Shane. We were like, "Hey, Shane, like, what if we, what if we made this show rap driven, rap and hip hop driven, and sort of like made it the soundtrack that you would want to listen to if you were sort of walking around the world?" And um, immediately, we we both loved it, and we looked at who had scored Luke Cage. And it was um, Adrian Young and Ali right. Shaheed Mohammed. Ali Shaheed Mohammed's from Tribe Called Quest, and Adrian right. Young is a, a famous hip hop producer who's done stuff with Snoop Dogg and Kendrick Lamar, Wu Tang, Ghostface Killer, um, and and a lot of other um, folks. And we we reached out to them, thinking it was a long shot. Uh, sent them the sizzle, and ha- we're very very surprised and happy when we got an email back from their agent saying this looks awesome. The guys love it. Um, let's let's have a meeting um, and. Adrian signed on to score it, and it really gives the show a totally different kind of feel. Um, and and um, and I I love it. I love it. And it's funny because when I was a kid, my parents really hated the music I listened to. They had a hard time, really hard time with it. And I think things have changed a lot because I, I've watched a few of the episodes with them, and both of them were like, you know, the show just feels so hip. And I think Adrian really killed it. He just did such a good yes. job. It just it's got a lot of style, um, and yeah. and and a big yeah. part of that is is because of the music. So, really, hats off to, to Adrian who really put his heart and soul into it. I think this kind of show has so much more music, and mm. in the edit, you know, it's very musically driven. It's like a it's like a mix between like parts unknown, Planet Earth, and some like '90s rap video. Right. <laughs> you know, so so uh, we really tried to do that in the in the, in the show, and I, I'm really pleased with how it turned out. Finally, on on this on this in terms of the project, I mean, what was the what was the biggest challenge in in getting this thing made? Was it COVID? Was this all done over over COVID? Yeah, I mean, that was that was certainly a challenge. There was you know for most of production, we were uh, we were testing every person on the crew uh, once or sometimes twice earlier mm. in the in the production window per day, um, and you know wearing masks even around each other in in the in the Airbnb at the end of the day until everybody's tests had come back negative right. for the afternoon. Um, and uh, you know obviously, except in a very few situations, the you know the host and the characters um, aren't wearing masks, but but everybody else did, is mm. and. Um, yeah, I mean, it it just added a layer of complication. I think I think really though, um, I don't know. I, I I think the the logistics of it would have been complicated and challenging with or without COVID. It's right, just uh, right. I think we went to you know forty plus different cities uh, over the course of production and in the course of you know one hundred and thirty, one hundred and forty days in the field, and. Um, Amazing. You know, coordinating a lot of things because it does involve natural history. It does involve a lot of outdoors mm-hmm. scenes, you know, um, coordinating Shane's schedule, which is complicated as a professor at Princeton University mm-hmm. with, you know, the needs of the production and the uh, the actual, you know, the calendar that nature follows, uh, you know, mm-hmm. certain behaviors and spectacles are only happening at certain times of year. And a lot of one-off events like the Westminster Dog Show, you know, you can't show up a week late because the dog show isn't happening anymore. Right. You can't go to the, you know, to Bath, Illinois to film the Carp Derby at any weekend other than that weekend when the Carp Derby happens. Um, and so just a huge number of moving parts. I think that's the biggest the biggest challenge. I, I think for me, it was just the, the, the grind, you know, it was just, it was a long process. You know, Neil and I, um, Neil and I had never made a television series before. And, um, you know, we've made television shows like our specials before, but most of those were very like Neil and I were, it was just us two and, and our small, at that time, smaller team, maybe just one or two, one other person working right. on it. Right. And this was kind of a different operation. And um, I think maybe we underestimated how much work it was going to be. So we'd be in the field, Neil and I would be in the field on like a 16 hour, 17 hour shoot. And we'd get back you know, get back to our Airbnb and we'd have to be reviewing cuts and right. sending feedback for, for, for our editors who were working at home. And, you know, we'd get back from a shoot, you know, at midnight and then be back in the office early the next morning to sort of stay up with post-production. So I think there was a lot of learning that happened and, and certainly um, there's no avoiding some of that grind if you're making a show like this, but I think maybe next time around we'll build in a little bit of um, 
buffer and maybe some additional some additional staff to sort of help with some of that. Well, and I guess, and I guess going back to this comment too about uh, yeah, you said your parents found that uh, found it really hip. I mean, I guess there's this fine line too of this this challenge of uh, uh, you know where you talk about difficult issues. There's obviously the issues facing the planet, but so there it's a very daunting time it seems. But ultimately, I feel like it's got an uplifting tone to you know a positive as you know tone to it and i guess is that something that was you were think consciously thinking about when you're doing this because i know a lot of nature docs kind of have at times in the past struggled with this yeah yeah i mean i think we wanted to be we wanted to be as real as we could be with the series yeah. that, that means you know taking an honest uh look at at our species and the impacts we have on the planet, um, and and also at, at the prospects we have for fixing it. And um, I think what we, you know, what what the series reveals to me, uh, and the process of making it revealed to me was that um, we have an enormous capacity for, you know, for messing things up if we're not careful. Um, but we also have an amazing capacity for good as a species. Mm -hmm. And it's really just a matter of what we decide to do collectively. Um, and so what I hope each of the episodes do does in a way is, is to, to showcase that aspect of the human footprint that, um, you know, we are all co-creators of whatever future transpires. And, um, and so we should be thinking carefully about that and, and, and what is the world we want to be living in. Yeah, I think, well, I think we should leave it at that, at least in terms of uh, talking about the film. But what is, uh, we just have a few minutes left uh, uh, together, but I was going to ask you, how do two, uh, and I'm s sort of asking this as a dad, because I've got a, my daughter's studying biology at uh, in college. Um, right. Yeah, even uh, evolutionary and ecology, uh, evolutionary biology and ecology, that's sort of her thing. Um, Very cool. How do you t how do you how do two evolutionary biologists go on to become documentarians? So Neil and I, um, we were both serious photographers um, before we got, got into grad school, and we met in two thousand eight in Costa Rica on a on a biology field course. So it's like a, this intensive course that sort of teaches you how to do experiments. And um, we looked at each other. We were both the exact same height, and we said we can either destroy each other or we can join forces. And so we, we started collaborating on, on science projects at the time. And we went on a bunch of fun trips to take photographs. And that was right around the time that digital SLRs started shooting high quality video. And Neil got a, got a grant from national geographic, um, to do his, to do some of his PhD research and they let him stop, start blogging, um, on, on that. And so we started working together on films that sort of, um, all, had an audience and at the time there was nobody making science videos on youtube like very few there, there wasn't a lot and the stuff we were making was awful but uh you know i think there was an audience who wanted it at the time and so even our awful videos people liked them and commented on them and um so throughout our the rest of our dissertation we started making science films about our research um and as we sort of got towards the end we had made you know a few dozen films and most of them weren't great, but we thought that they were, um, and we really had enjoyed the process. And so together we kind of decided, let's, let's not pursue an academic career. Let's go into making documentary films. I think if we had known how difficult it was, we probably would have been scared to make that jump, but we were just totally in the dark. We had no idea what we were doing and we're um, just very confident <laughs> that we could do it if we put our minds to it. Um, and so that was the beginning. That was that was uh, 2011 when we started Day's Edge, and then um, you know slowly the first few years were hard, but we slowly sort of built a, a you know a collection of, of clients who trust us, and and now I think um, have have really improved our skills as filmmakers and and have committed ourselves to this this career. Well, well done, and uh, th you know I'm glad you did make that decision, and uh, and in in other ways, it's still early days for you guys, isn't it? And so, uh, what's I mean, what's next? I mean, I assume another sort of nature doc, or as you, as you said, this is a, a repeatable series potentially. Is there going to be more human footprint episodes coming down the line? Well, we hope so. If if all your if all your listeners and viewers tune into Human Footprint, maybe that'll be enough to tip the scales. 
Well, you're, you're, flat- you're very flattering. We do have a good audience, but I, you know, but uh, <laughs> anyway. No, we're cert- we 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 are very we are very hopeful that we get you know a second season and maybe more. I think there's a lot more stories to tell. Um, Shane has a lot you know a lot more to to say about the human footprint as do we, and um, so we'll we'll see. With any luck, you know we'll we'll get to do we'll get to do more of this this series. And of course, we're always uh, thinking about and and pitching you know the ne- the next big science or or natural history series as well. So. Um, we don't know exactly what that'll be yet. That kind of depends on what the commissioners actually want to make, but uh, we have no shortage of, of uh, plans in the works. All right. Um, well, I, it's been a joy having both of you on. I've, I really enjoyed the series. Just to remind our listeners, we've been talking with uh, Nate Dappen, Dappen and Neil Lawson, the award-winning filmmakers behind Human Footprint. Uh, for those of you in the U.S., it's on PBS. Uh, it premiered on July 5th, or even here in the U.K. I'm not sure if it's on PBS America. Uh, it's also, you can find it on Amazon Prime. Three re- uh, episodes released thus far and three more to come. Do check it out. So, guys, thank you so much again. And uh, when you do your next project, we'd love to have you on again, so, if we haven't scared you off. So, thanks so much. Fantastic. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Matt. Really appreciate it. We hope you enjoyed that episode of Factual America. If you did, please remember to like us and share us with your friends and family, wherever you happen to listen or watch podcasts. I would also like to thank those who make this podcast possible. A big shout out to Sam and Joe at Intersound Audio in York, England. A big thanks to Amy Ord, our podcast manager at Alamo Pictures, who makes sure we continue getting great guests onto the show and everything runs smoothly. And finally, a big thanks to you, our listeners. Many of you have been with us for four incredible seasons. Please keep sending us feedback and episode ideas, whether it is on YouTube, social media, or directly by email. This is Factual America, signing off. You've been listening to Factual America. This podcast is produced by Alamo Pictures, specializing in documentaries, television, and shorts about the USA for international audiences. Head on down to the show notes for more information about today's episode, our guests, and the team behind the podcast. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Alamo Pictures. Be the first to hear about new productions, festivals showing our films, and to connect with our team. Our homepage is alamopictures.co.uk.